welcome to this, the second episode of Fort Collins Before. In the middle of the 1800s, teepees like this one would have been a common sight in what is today Fort Collins. What I have here is the woolly skin of a bison or buffalo. Now, as you recall from the last episode, we saw that the early peoples in the area that would become Fort Collins used this skin and the rest of the buffalo for their food, clothing, and shelter. In this episode, we're going to see that the Plains Indians of the middle 1800s also used the buffalo for food, clothing, and shelter, but perhaps used them in a different way. The reason for this change in the way that the buffalo was used happened because the Plains Indians that were in this area began to have interaction, more interaction, with the settlers coming from the east. Specifically in this episode, we're going to look at Chief Friday and his interaction with the folks uh, that were settling the area that would become Fort Collins. The story of the historic tribes of Larimer County really begins around 1800. Uh, up until that time, many of the tribes that were coming through this area were being pushed southward in this flow of people. Uh, as the American people were moving westward from the east coast of the United States into the new frontier, which is now the middle of the country, a lot of the tribes in the northern part of that area, like in the states of Minnesota and North and South Dakota, were being pushed westward by the arrival of all these pioneers and settlers. So around 1800, as these tribal groups came through the area, it settled down into pretty much two primary tribes that were in the area where we now live. That was the Arapaho, who lived mostly out on the plains, and the Ute Indians, who lived up in the mountains above Fort Collins. How much do we know about the Utes that lived up in the mountains? The Ute Indians, we don't know too much about who they were exactly in this area. They didn't have a well-known chief in this area, but we do know that they were there because some of the early fur trappers and pioneers who settled here and the cavalry and explorers that came through in the early 1800s had some encounters with them and uh, found them to be not so happy about people moving into their area. They often would come down and raid other tribes in the area for horses and for some food and other supplies and they did pretty much the same thing on occasion with the uh, settlers in the area and the fur trappers and others were a little nervous about going up into the mountains above what is now Fort Collins for fear that the Ute Indians would attack them because they were protective up there. They treated the area like it was a fort and that it belonged to them which it of course did. So the Arapaho uh, we know a lot more about and they actually have kind of an interesting story uh, attached to them. In 1831, uh, three small Arapaho children were found wandering out on the plains somewhere east of Fort Collins by a gentleman named Thomas Fitzpatrick. Thomas Fitzpatrick is someone who comes up, his name comes up very often when you read about the history of the Western United States, especially the region that we live in, uh, because he was very well known as a, as a trapper fur trapper. He was also known as a scout. In other words, he led a lot of the early expeditions to this area because he learned the area well. Uh, he was an interpreter with the Native American tribes in the area. And he also worked as an Indian agent for a time for the federal government, which means that he was the contact person between the government and the Native American tribes in this region. So Thomas Fitzpatrick was out riding across the prairie one day in 1831. It's a long, long time ago. Uh, but about 170 some years ago, and he came across these three little Native American boys who were wandering out on the plains, and they were lost. Well, he took them with him. He was actually on his way to St. Louis. He was going back home, uh, or to the big city basically, uh, from the Colorado frontier and Wyoming frontier, and he became very uh, taken with one of these children, a six-year-old boy, by the name of Warshinun. Warshinun in the Arapaho language meant black spot. And this little boy was, seemed to him to be a pretty smart boy and he liked him. So he took him back to St. Louis with him. Of course today that's not something you could really do. But in those days on the frontier he didn't know where this boy belonged and the other two kids belonged. And he was headed to St. Louis anyway. So he took this little boy named Warshinun with him. I understand that not much is known about what happened to the two of the boys, but what happened to Warshinun when he went to St. Louis? There are a couple stories about what happened to Warshinun. First of all, he was found 
apparently on a Friday. That's one of the stories of what, when he was found. And Thomas Fitzpatrick decided to name him Friday. There was also a book that had been written about 100 years old, earlier um, called Robinson Crusoe uh, that was a very famous book still at that time. And one of the characters in that book had the name Friday also, someone who was found out wandering and his name was Friday, he was named Friday. So whatever story is true, we don't know, but this little boy na became named Friday. <clears throat> and from that point on, he was always known as Friday Fitzpatrick because Thomas Fitzpatrick took him back to St. Louis and adopted him as his own son. In St. Louis, Tom, uh, Friday Fitzpatrick, this little boy, was put into a school. And he spent the next seven years during the school year learning math and geography and science and English and all these other subjects that the kids were taught in school at the time. And he became educated. During the summers, he would leave St. Louis with his adopted father, with Thomas Fitzpatrick, and they would get on their horses and they would head back out to the western frontier to lead expeditions coming west, to go fur trapping, and to do other things that they were doing at the time. Friday had experienced a unique upbringing born as an Arapaho and then educated by Anglos in America. Did he ever find his Arapaho family again? Well, after about seven years in St. Louis, they headed out one summer to the west, and they came to the valley of the Cache River, where we happen to live now. And they wandered into a, a, an Arapaho village, and all of a sudden, a woman recognized this boy. Of course, he wasn't six years old anymore. He was seven years older than that. Uh, but she recognized that this was her son. So he had all of a sudden found his people, and he was convinced to go back and live with them again. So Friday Fitzpatrick uh, went back to live with his family and his band of Arapaho, which is where it turned out he had come from, along the valley of the Cache River. Friday's youth taught him a lot about the American people and their ideas, so he had an understanding of the big picture, the drive of Americans to come west. With this understanding, how did it help him with his own people, the Arapaho? Well, a few years went by, and Friday Fitzpatrick, Fitzpatrick grew up, and he became very well known among his people as a great warrior and a successful hunter, and he became very well respected. But there was something very different about him. He spoke perfect English, and he knew about the sciences, and he knew about math, and he also understood from his life back in St. Louis, um, he understood the power of the American movement across the continent, that, that more people were coming and were going to be settling on these Native American lands. He also understood how powerful the American military was at the time and that they weren't something that could be treated lightly, that they had a lot of power. And he became very concerned that if his band of Arapaho, his tribe or group of Arapaho, uh, and when I say band, I mean several families that were living together, it could be 200 people, 300 people maybe. He felt that if they resisted the American movement into the valley of the Cache Laputa River in this area of Colorado, that they would really be uh, up for a lot of trouble. So he resolved, he decided to become um, someone who promoted peace between the settlers and the government and the Arapaho. Well, in 1851, the, a lot of the tribes from the western United States, from this Rocky Mountain region, uh, met at Fort Laramie, which is up in Wyoming. It's north of Cheyenne along the Laramie River. This is a wonderful place to maybe go see someday. Um, but all the tribal leaders met in 1851 at Fort Laramie to sign the Treaty of Fort Laramie. The government was basically trying to get the Native Americans to sign treaties that would give away the Native Americans' land to the United States government so that settlers could come in and that the land could be used for farming or ranching or building towns or for the railroad to come through. And <clears throat> this was one of a long series of treaties that, was, that were signed by the Native American tribal chiefs in this long process of giving away their land, which they weren't happy about. So a treaty is when two different groups of people come together and make a, an agreement that's written. What action did Friday bring to the Treaty of Fort Laramie? Friday went there um, 
probably to serve as an interpreter, and also because he was well respected among the Cash Laputer band of the Arapaho Indians. And he um, was well respected there because he could interpret between the Arapaho people and the government officials who were there. After that treaty was signed, he was invited along with a number of other Indian chiefs, Native American chiefs, to go to Washington, D.C. Uh, together with Thomas Fitzpatrick. They went there and met, met what they called the Great Father, who was President Millard Fillmore at the time. And they met with the president, and then when Friday came back to the area of the Cache Laputa River, he was even more respected because he had gone all the way to Washington uh, to represent the Arapaho of this area. <clears throat> so what happened over time was he became a great leader among the Arapaho of the Cache Laputa area, and he became their chief. So he became known as Chief Friday. So did Chief Friday and his people's worries about their future involve a fear of being moved to a new land? In 1861, the government decided that they wanted the tribes in this region to sign another treaty called the Treaty of Fort Wise. What that treaty said was that the um, government under that treaty would take the land that these tribes had lived on for generations and that the tribal groups like the Arapaho would be moved to what is now Oklahoma to live on reservations. Well, Chief Friday didn't like that idea and his people didn't like that idea either. A number of the Arapaho chiefs signed the Treaty of Fort Wise and began to move to the southeast into what is now Oklahoma to live on reservations. But some of them resisted that. Um, a few years later in 1864, now this is when the Civil War was going on back east, uh, in 1864 there was a terrible event that happened out on the eastern plains of Colorado when a bunch of cavalry soldiers, many of them from Denver, uh, some of them even from the Fort Collins area, uh, rode out onto the Eastern Plains and found a camp of Arapaho and Cheyenne Indians camped out along what was called Sand Creek, and they attacked them and killed many of them. Well, this started an uprising out on the Eastern Plains, east of Fort Collins. The young chiefs primarily, who didn't like what had happened and what was happening to their people, rose up and decided to fight against the United States government. So. Following that, in 1864, all kinds of tensions started happening out on the plains. A lot of wagon trains started being attacked, stagecoaches were attacked. Uh, there were a lot of uh, wagons crossing the plains that were bringing supplies in and out of Denver and other areas of the West. Uh, the mail was being transported by wagons, and the Native American tribes, those who were unhappy about what was happening to them, that started to attack these these wagon trains, these stagecoaches and horseback riders that were crossing the plains. Uh, they also attacked some of the small towns that were being formed and some of the um, uh, pioneer cabins and things like that. And they killed a lot of people, but they were very upset about what was happening to their own people. The violent acts against the Native Americans at the Sand Creek Massacre caused Native Americans in the, in the state to rally together and some reacted violently in uprisings. How did Chief Friday lead his people through this time? A lot of pressure was put on Chief Friday to fight against the United States government, but Friday, because of his background in education, understood that there wasn't much hope of success. So he decided again to try to keep the peace. Uh, in this area, of course, by that time, there were a lot of settlers coming in and building cabins along the rivers here. And, and uh, they had some very ex interesting experiences with Chief Friday and his people. There was one account that I've read where um, people were often surprised at the fact that he was educated. And, uh, settlers and people moving through the area where Fort Collins is now would often find him riding up at full speed on horseback with some of his warriors and they'd be frightened because they didn't know what these Native Americans were going to do to them and they would pull up all of a sudden on their horses in front of these settlers or immigrants and start, he would start speaking to them in beautiful English and it was shocking to them. <laughs> They'd never heard a Native American who could speak like that before. And so, because of his language skills and his understanding of, uh, of um, American culture 
and um, his desire to keep peace here, uh, the Arapaho basically lived very peaceably with the settlers in the Fort Collins and Lamar County area. Uh, during the 1860s, it became very difficult for Chief Friday's people to live. What I mean by that is that they hunted along the river, uh, the Big Thompson River also, in addition to the Cache Laputa River. That's where they found all the animals living that they were able to hunt. Of course, there were buffalo before that, but many of the buffalo had disappeared by that time, basically had been killed off by that time. And so they were living largely on other animals they could catch along the rivers, such as deer and rabbits, uh, those types of animals. Well, with settlers moving into the area, a lot of that game, uh, those animals started to disappear because there were just too many people with not enough food available. So Friday, in, this, in the uh, winter of 1864, uh, wrote to the territorial governor and asked for help because his band of, of uh, Arapaho were starting to starve. Uh, and he was afraid they wouldn't make it through the winter. We didn't talk much about how Chief Friday and his people lived day to day, but during this time of unrest, how did they manage to survive? The ter territorial governor did send supplies to get them through the winter, uh, and he moved his band uh, right next to Fort Collins, this new fort that was established, a uh, cavalry fort along the uh, Poudre River. And so they sought out basically the protection of the fort which is kind of strange because the fort was originally put there to protect the settlers from the natives. But here now, all of a sudden, the Native Americans came to, for protection to the fort, and the fort did look after them over the winter of 1864. They managed to survive here for a couple more years as this uprising was going on on the Eastern Plains, and they survived here peaceably, but under very difficult conditions, until finally in 1869, the government made an effort to push all the Arapaho, the rest of the Arapaho, out of Colorado into the reservations that had been established in Oklahoma. How did Chief Friday feel about moving his people to Oklahoma, a land that's hundreds of miles away from their home, that's different animals to hunt, uh, different locations for finding water, a complete change in their environment and life? Chief Friday and his band of Arapaho really didn't want to go to Oklahoma. They didn't feel that that was the place for them. They felt much more comfortable staying here. Friday asked the local Indian agent if there's any possibility that they could stay here and keep the land north of the Poudre River as a reservation for themselves. But he was told by the Indian agent that that land already contained 16 settlers and a stagecoach route and it was no longer available to them. So it was at that point that the Arapaho under Chief Friday realized that they had no future here, which was a very sad thing. They decided to move up into Wyoming. They didn't know where they were going to go, but they felt that Wyoming made more sense to them than Oklahoma. They were probably just more familiar with the landscape and how to live in that landscape. So they headed up into Wyoming, and after a number of years, they were accepted onto the Wind River Reservation in northern Wyoming, which is where Chief Friday's descendants live today. He finally, uh, in the 1870s, worked for a time as an interpreter and a scout for the government. And Chief Friday died on the Wind Res River Reservation in 1881 and was buried there in an unmarked grave, so no one knows exactly where he was buried there. Now, during their time here on the Poudre River, the, I've heard there was a tree that Chief Friday liked to gather. Members right. Of the Arapaho there was a very that. famous tree, and it was a tourist site for many years, actually. Uh, it was located, it was called the Arapaho Council Tree. It was a big, big cottonwood uh, that was said to be about 100 feet tall and about 16 feet around the trunk. Wow. It was a big tree. And it was located out right near where the Poudre River crosses under Interstate 25 today, uh, just north of there in kind of a flat area. And that tree was uh, supposedly where, according to early pioneer accounts, uh, where the Arapaho under Friday used to gather. And uh, they probably held ceremonies there. Uh, uh, there are all kinds of other stories about what might have taken place around that tree. No one knows for sure whether they're true or not, uh, that they might have buried some of their dead in the branches of the tree. The Arapaho didn't put dead, dead bodies in the ground. They put them on tree limbs, mm -hmm. on platforms. And that's probably what they did there. Um, but that was known as the Arapaho Council Tree, and it was present 
uh, there on that site until the 1930s and people used to go out there all the time to have picnics around the Arapaho Council tree. Uh, but unfortunately in the 1930s uh, an area farmer let a field fire go out of control and the tree burned down. Mm -hmm. So that tree is no longer there for us to see. That's too bad. Well we um, probably don't have any time left unfortunately right now for any other discussion about them but thank you. Thank you. As we have just seen, the Arapaho Indian tribe led by Friday was the tribe that was most closely associated with the area that is now Fort Collins. When they had important decisions to make, they would go to their council tree. It was a tree that was much like the one that you see behind me. Join us next time for Fort Collins Before when we will look at other people that were coming through this area, the trappers, the traders, and the settlers. So join us next time for another episode of Fort Collins Before. Mm -hmm.